BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a couple quick announcements to start off. We've assembled some of our uploads on psychology into a playlist here on the channel Black Box Online Radio. Sometimes we have discussions about psychology, human behavior, just asking the questions, how do people function? How do people behave in certain contexts? And in fact, I think that those are some of the best things that we have created here on the channel. So if you'd like to check out our playlist on BBOR Psychology, it is available in the description box here. The best way you can support this channel is just by listening to some more of our content. And as always, you can like and subscribe. Now, the next thing I would say is that I was eating popcorn while I was watching a movie tonight. The first time I've done that in about six months, like had popcorn in a movie. It's pretty classic, right? One of the pieces of popcorn, though, cut open my throat and I was coughing nonstop for a very long time. So just saying, if I have to stop this recording and this turns into a short episode, um, that might happen. But I think I'm all right now. And sadly, the movie I was watching was Airplane Mode by Logan Paul. Well, with featuring Logan Paul. So I had two lousy experiences at once. And on to our topic for today. This was a suggestion that came to us from one of the listeners giving a shout out to YouTube user Postmark. What about Maura Murray? Do you have any out of the black box ideas to share about Maura Murray? Theories that haven't gotten enough attention. And because this was a user suggested upload, I would just like to open the field again. If anybody has anything that they would like to hear about or is there a true crime case that you want to know more about? And like this one, are there any theories that you think maybe don't have enough attention? Or is there just something that you're curious about that you would like to hear more from on YouTube? Please drop your suggestions for our episodes in the comments section below. I would love to hear from you. Any subject of any kind is fair game. And, I, and if we look at this question, any theories um, that haven't gotten enough attention? Well, the first one is, one that we have mentioned previously on this channel, and that is that Maura Murray disappeared from Haverhill, New Hampshire in February of 2004, February 9th, 2004. She crashed her car into a snowbank in New Hampshire, as we said, and she was never seen again. What happened after that? Almost nobody knows. Shortly after Maura Murray crashed her car into the snowbank, a school bus driver named Butch Atwood drove by and he saw Maura, Maura Murray outside of the car and he asked her if she needed help. And then she said that she had already called AAA, but Butch Atwood knew that that was a lie because the, um, or he knew that that was um, not true, we should say, because they didn't have any cell service there. So he thought that there was something suspicious and his wife, well, like once he got home, his wife called and the authorities and they talked about how they had just seen a girl out by the car, but when they asked um, Butch Atwood's wife, where is she now? They said, I have no idea where she is. That is the, the uh, quotation. What happened to Maura Murray? Well, one of the outside the box theories that we did talk about on this channel was that Maura Murray could have been inspired by the movie Bottle Rocket. And I read this on a blog years ago. Somebody said that Maura Murray's um, favorite movie or one of her favorite movies was Bottle Rocket. It's a Wes Anderson film with Owen Wilson and Luke Wilson, of course. Um, and that there's this scene in there where some people are thinking about running away and starting a new life. One of those types of ideas. And I watched the movie Bottle Rocket because I saw it was available on CBS All Access. And I mean, it's highly, highly unlikely, but that is an outside of the box theory. By the way, I love the idea outside of the black box ideas to share. I love that uh, phrasing. So I thought we could talk about something that was perhaps a little bit more credible than this um, far out theory associated with the movie Bottle Rocket. But what I would say is that one of the things that I first thought about once I really began learning about Maura Murray back in 2014 and 2015 was that what if all of the theories are true? How is that possible? Well, my immediate first instinct was after Maura Murray disappeared, the police did um, not exactly investigate the area completely. And this is one of the big criticisms that was made by Maura Murray's father, Fred Murray. He's saying that they really waited 36 hours before they were completely investigating, scouring the area, looking for Maura. So he's like, that's one of the things that really held down the investigation. 
and perhaps they lost a lot of valuable evidence and a lot of things were um, lost in that process. But one of the things that I thought about was if they had scoured a five mile radius around the site, if they had scoured a seven mile radius out around Moore's crash site in Haverhill, New Hampshire, by the weathered barn, then I was like, well, obviously she moved to an area outside of that five to seven mile radius. And then I began to think, what it appears is that Maura Murray entered somebody's car. And the podcast, 107 Degrees, which is a deep dive into Maura Murray, as well as missing Maura Murray as well, they all talk about this, but I heard about it on 107 Degrees that search dogs were used to track Maura Murray's scent. And they lost her scent about 100 yards from the, s- 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 the scene of the crash. And they was actually in the middle of the road, not off to the side, not in the woods, it was in the middle of the road where the search dogs lost her scent, which all means almost certainly that she would have entered into somebody's car. So then Moore would have entered into somebody's car. And Fred Murray talked about how his first instinct with this was that some local dirt bag snatched her. And this is a very large theory. And a lot of people begin to pinpoint which dirt bag are you going to be talking about. And I really don't um, even want to say his name because it's almost unfair in the sense that he's not uh, been charged with this. He's not a suspect of, but I mean, he hasn't been arrested, we should say, but uh, there's an individual named Rick Forsier who was living nearby, who has exhibited a lot of suspicious behavior. And one of the people that was in, interviewed on the podcast, 107 Degrees, said very clearly, he believed that Maura Murray was abducted by Rick Forsier. He lived very close to the crash site. And then he immediately took her to his home where she was murdered. And then her body was buried Somewhere in on his property, I guess that was the answer that was um, put forward by this investigator. Once again, the podcast 107 Degrees is um, it's excellent. And we're going to say a few things that I've learned from them that um, perhaps they really change my perspective on the case. But I would like to continue that by saying, OK, can you just imagine what we said first about the all is one theory? Maura Murray enters somebody's car after crashing her Saturn. She enters into somebody else's car and she's going to get a ride to get help. Why would she refuse help from Butch Atwood? One of the things Aaron from 107 Degrees put forward was that her first instinct was perhaps, I don't want to accept help from this person passing by. I want to solve the problem myself. So she starts walking and then someone offers her a ride to the next town. She didn't want to just sit there and have somebody else solve the problem for her. That was her programming. That was her go to mode then Maura Murray is going to be exiting that person's car at some point. Perhaps this local dirtbag did make a move on her. Perhaps a man did try to sexually assault her, and she got away from him in a very remote and secluded area. He says that he's going to give her a ride to the town to make a phone call or to uh, get some type of service, and then No, bear in mind, he would have known that there would have been no cell service either if he were some type of local dirtbag. So then Maura Murray would have exited his car. She fights him off and she exits in a very remote area of the New Hampshire wilderness. At that point, Maura, with her backpack, enters into either the, the forest, a wooded area of some sorts, and then she begins to drink herself into oblivion. And on the Missing Maura Murray podcast, they would talk about how like Maura was a very experienced hiker. Her father, Fred Murray, in one of his interviews said very clearly she never would have enter- entered into the forest and because she would have known that there's no point. She would have known that it's just an impractical move. And I would say that the only possibility that Maura Murray would have died in the woods would have been that if she had just given up, if she had just reached a breaking point, as they said, back against a tree, sitting down, perhaps with a bottle of alcohol and as we said, um, you know, like would have frozen to death, succumbed to the elements. But outside of this addition, this radius, they're like all of the radiuses that you can see here on the map. So then this would almost be someone, as we said, abduction, assault. Someone's trying to murder her. She gets away. And then you could even say accidental death and suicide, giving up, meaning succumbing to the elements, all the theories, all the possibilities come into one. I would say that if there wasn't a wrongful death, like if this was not an incident of foul play, then there are a few questions that we would have. If you look at the uh, image that we have here on the screen, you will see many different things associated with the searches. 
And some of the searches were conducted almost immediately, but in July of 2004, you'll see there that 100 searches were conducted, or 100 searchers were were examining the one-mile radius surrounding Morris Carr. I would say, though, that was done in July. One of the things that I had read about this on a forum years ago was someone was saying, if she w remained undiscovered until the springtime, she uh, disappeared in February, if she remained undiscovered until the springtime, then it would be nearly impossible to find her skeletal remains. We're talking about if Mora did indeed die in the woods, because they're like a forest can swallow people. First, you have melting snow, which is going to move the body to a certain place. It's not going to, Mora wouldn't ne necessarily have to have been located exactly where she would have passed away, if indeed she did enter the forest at some point. I mean, that's not 100% certain either. That is just a possibility, but heavy snowfall, of course, in northern New Hampshire, and then vegetation, let alone predators, four-legged creatures would have also had the possibility of moving the body. I mean, we even see things in the true crime world where serial killers and murderers bury people in the woods because they expect that the animals and the wildlife are going to move the body to various locations and no one will ever figure it out. I was just watching something about that on uh, Forensic Files recently. So what we can say with something like that is, I mean, I think that there is a certain case to be made for that point, that a forest can swallow a person. But that is talking very precisely about Mora's physical body, because one of the things that I did hear of missing Mora Murray, not from uh, Lance and Tim, but some somebody that they were interviewing, I think he was only on there one time, but I haven't heard every single episode they've put out on that show. And he was saying that the things that would be left behind were would be perhaps more as backpack. That could be something. Or other items of clothing, maybe her shoes. Those things would be something that could be left behind and would be easier to survive the process of decomposition. Whereas um, uh, Moore's physical remains would be much harder to, to uh, remain preserved, especially by the month of July in 2004. But in February of 2004, February 11th, you'll also see here that they did do an aerial examination of the area, a 10-mile radius from Maura Murray's car search, uh, from Maura Murray's car searching by helicopter. So I think that that would also encourage the foul play theory at some point. I really, I was not a big believer in the foul play theory at first. I was like, it seemed to me that Maura Murray got into somebody's car and then she just continued on foot. And um, then she met some type of untimely death. That's why I called it the all is one theory, that she crashes the car by mistake. I don't ever believe that Maura Murray would have crashed the car intentionally. And um, as far as Maura Murray living in Canada, I believe that there was a certain individual who was uh, promoting that just so he could sell books. And he's throwing around all these wild accusations that Fred Murray and Maura Murray were involved in this type of incestuous relationship. He was intentionally stirring the pot to promote his own writing career, which is a despicable thing to do because, I mean, this is a real tragedy. These are real people that he was just playing around with. I mean, so... It appears to me, I mean, he can say whatever he wants, true crime addict, whatever his name is. I don't say it on this channel. And then the next thing to say about that is I can't even entertain any type of tandem driver theory in this case, in this all is one thing. I think that a more plausible variant of the all is one theory is we said, Mora gets into the car accident. Then she gets into somebody's car. That person drives her to a location, drops her off, perhaps near a town, or perhaps that he tried to sexually assault her either when she was in the vehicle or drove her to some secluded area that would give Mora a definitive motivation to enter the woods to escape an attacker. And who knows how far she could be. As you see here, this, um, this radius does not extend to, um, like completely throughout the state of New Hampshire. There's still a lot of ground that be could be covered. Who knows exactly how far he would have driven her. And one of the things that people have talked about is that Mora could have um, been forced into the car by gunpoint. And one of, to the credit of Lance and Tim, they did do some research about what would be the probability that Mora Murray would have been abducted by an opportunistic serial killer. And it's like nearly impossible. There's always a chance, but 
this whole thing about the person abducting her was an opportunistic serial killer. I um I never thought there was any credibility credibility to that. They were just like the 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 chance of that happening is so low. What I think would be much more plausible is a man would abduct Maura Murray. She was a twenty one year old like attractive woman she gets into his car and he tries to sexually assault her or even make an advance on her and she refuses him and that causes the altercation if he had driven her to some secluded area perhaps she would have taken off and at that point she would have had motivation to enter the forest so all the possibilities are really coming together except for this um, tandem driver theory where Mora intentionally crashes the car and then gets in some type of red truck and drives off to Quebec um I don't think that that is very plausible. Now, I said that there were a few things that really changed my perspective about the case that came from 107 degrees. Number one, they said that there was a Diet Coke bottle that was found underneath the Saturn that had a bizarre odor. And many people thought that it was red wine. But one of the things that um, Aaron and Ethan from 107 degrees were sharing is that the box of Franzia wine that Mora had in the back seat was not open, so they proposed that this was not wine in the bottle, it was red antifreeze, that perhaps Mora crashed the car, and then she tried to do something with uh, under the hood, got frustrated, poured the red antifreeze out into the snow, and threw the bottle down, and it rolled under the car. Why is this important? Because, number one, it would mean that Mora wouldn't be intoxicated, and number two, people have also brought up the point that if Mora had been driving and there was a Diet Coke bottle filled with wine in the front seat, in the cup holder, and that, um, and that if that had, if she had been in a car crash, the wine would have gone everywhere and it would also have been on her clothes, perhaps even on her face still. Butch Atwood didn't seem to remark anything about that. And I really began to think that that is somewhat more plausible of an answer that Maura Murray did not pour her wine bo her wine out into the snow and kick the bottle under the car. I think that, I mean, let alone, if you're going to try and cover your tracks and try and hide the fact that you were drunk driving, I mean, why would you leave the Coke bottle behind when you had a backpack? I mean, I could understand pouring the wine out into the snow, but then why would you leave behind the item that would incriminate you? And the next thing to say is the rag and the tailpipe issue. At first, in instantly, I thought Mora did that to be a distraction from the wine that she poured out, that she was trying to just distract people from the fact that this could be a case of drunk driving. Bear in mind, Mora had been in a recent accident and collision, uh, crashing a car into a guardrail previously in within a very, very short span of time. So the thing that they also provided on 107 degrees was that what they believed is that Moore's car was very famously running on three cylinders, as Fred Murray said. He also said that um, the engine was smoking and the smoke would come out through the exhaust pipe. So the reason why Mora put the rag in the tailpipe was she thought that it would prevent the smoke from coming out of the car and it wouldn't draw attention to it. And um, there's a very famous line that Fred Murray offered that information to Mora that if you push a rag up into the tailpipe, it'll put more pressure on the engine and it'll keep it from smoking. But what I think that really means is that he didn't want her to do that when she was driving. It's like you would put the rag there so the smoke wouldn't start pouring out of the engine or that the smoke wouldn't pour out of the exhaust pipe. Excuse me. Excuse me. And um, I think that there is a certain sense of plausibility to that. That would mean that instantly Mora wasn't immediately trying to go into the forest and commit suicide. That's why I said all is one theory. First, you know, she's walking, then she gets into a car, someone tries to sexually assault her, she gets away, and she makes her way through the wooded areas of New Hampshire, and at some point, somehow, she just gives up and then succumbs to the elements. So it's all the lines are being blurred. It's every single possibility, with the exception of that lousy tandem driver theory from that lousy true crime addict guy. Now, I would be very curious what other people would have to say about this. What do you think happened to Maura Murray? If, you, if there are any details that you think are very important that we've overlooked, please share them. This is not a, intended to be the biggest deep dive exploration. Um, it's, in fact, somewhat of a general upload and somewhat of a general discussion. But I would still love to hear your ideas in the comments section below about all of the steps that we have mentioned. I mean, uh, we've also talked about the Butch Atwood theory in the past, and once again, that wasn't my own observation, something that someone else had proposed.